few days ago, Louise and I talked about, uh, I think it was Louise, about it today. He said, let's just talk about attachment. I said, well, yeah, yeah. And about a relationship. It's tricky. Um, I have this friend, Marilyn Cloitre, who is still a CBT person, despite my best efforts. Um, and she did a study a number of years ago that I think was, she's a very good scientist. Um, she did a study treating sexually abused girls with CBT. And when the study was over, before she analyzed the data, she was convinced that clearly what made the difference was not all the hocus pocus of the therapy, but the relationship that the girls had with the therapist. And being a therapist, being a, being a uh, researcher, you test your hypotheses. It's one of the great things about being a researcher is you check out whether your cherished beliefs are actually true or not. And the best part about science is when you're wrong. Because then you need to grow into something new. And so I don't really like people all that much who sort of find one thing and then stay with it and try to prove everything that it always works for everybody. Because that's not really the best thing to do. Um, so Marilyn tests whether the relationship predicts outcome. And so she makes a measure of it. And it turns out this little NS means non-significant. Anything that's a trend in the wrong direction. I bet there's nobody in this room who really believes that, that the relationship is not really relevant for the outcome of PTSD and sexually abused girls. But when you're faced with a piece of science like that, you have to go and say, is Marilyn doing the wrong thing? Or did she study the wrong thing? Or is there something to what she found? If you don't care about science, you don't care about it, because then you're a religious person, you just do what you believe. Uh, um, so the relationship is not what predicts outcome. And then she looks at a whole bunch of other factors, how much PTSD before, big difference. If you had more trauma before, the less, the harder it gets. But the big thing that came out is something that she calls negative mood regulation, which I would call affect regulation. And it turns out that if, as a therapist, you can help the people you work with to regulate their affect, huge effect on getting better. So the conclusion is, very serious conclusion, is that you're only as good a therapist as you're an affect regulator. And that being sort of the core of our work, I'm sure that all of you took numerous courses in your life on affect regulation, right? <laughs> Except you didn't, which is bizarre. Uh, it's, it's all this bizarre disparity between how things work and what people advertise. Um, and so, and I could really relate to that because I have two kids, and I won't talk about it today, but I'll talk about it on s Saturday if you come to the play conference. I have two kids, and my first kid came into the world, out in the world, and said, "Hi, good to meet you guys. This is really going to be cool." My second kid comes out two years later, takes one look at the world, and tries to crawl right back in again. <laughs> so a different temperament. And my son used to be a really very dysregulated kid. And he would lie in bed, and he refused to go to school, and he refused to eat. And he was one of those kids where you say yes, he does the opposite. And we say no, he does the opposite also. Which is the only way to get there. It's not only trauma. Uh, he was wired in a weird way. And I certainly realized in those days, when he, before he had a real frontal lobe, that you're only as good a parent as you're an affect regulator. And if you can get your kid to go to school, and if you cannot get your kid to go to sleep, you are a failure as a parent. If you cannot get your patients to feel safe and to stop hurting themselves and other people, you are a failure as a therapist. Sorry. It's okay to do it, but don't charge people. Okay? <laughs> uh, I mean, if you get a plumber and it doesn't work, you don't pay your plumber. The opposite is true for therapists. Like, uh, anyway, so that's where it starts. So 
The next piece is that a long time ago, Judy Herman and I were working at the same Harvard Hospital. And we started to get together to talk about things. And we started to see trauma everywhere. And so there was this big, nice database at the clinic of all the patients who come to the clinic, and they had measured every damn thing, except they had not taken a trauma history. So uh, we decided to take a trauma history on all of these patients. And so Judy and I got together a lot and tried to think about how do you take a trauma history? Uh, these days, people say, hi, I'm Dr. Jones. Uh, were you raped as a child? That's not the way to get the trauma history. Nobody will tell you that stuff. And uh, one of my favorite sayings is a poem by W.H. Auden, the poet, that goes, truth like love and sleep resents approaches that are too intense. And so straightforward asking people, they won't give you the history. At the VA these days, people say, tell me about your trauma. Nobody's going to tell anybody about the trauma to a stranger. Crazy, crazy system, man. Like, so what we decided to do is we asked people, where do you live? Who do you live with? Um, when, who does the shopping? Who does the cleaning? Who cooks the meals? Sort of important questions that us lofty folks tend to sort of ignore, but they're the stuff of daily life. And let me ask you, so when you're sick, who takes you to the doctor? When your car isn't working, who helps you with your car? When you're really upset, who do you talk to? And we didn't know anything about the people we interviewed, but we got some really remarkably interesting articles, like who do you talk to? My dog. Who takes you to the doctor when you're sick? My therapist. So there's a lot of screwy stuff starting to come up. And then we went, so when you were a kid, uh, who in your family was affectionate to you? Who recognized you as a special person? And then we asked a killer question. Was there safe with anybody? Did you feel safe with anybody growing up? And one out of three patients said, I felt safe with nobody growing up. That was the killer question. The issue of, did people know you? that people for you make you feel safe. So we sort of slowly moved into the ecology of people's lives. We don't talk about trauma yet. Then we ask about family discipline and conflict resolution. Who made the rules and enforced the discipline at home? Ask yourself, who made the rules and enforced the discipline at home? What were the rules like? Like the kid I just showed you said, the strongest, meanest, drunkest person made the rules. Whatever guy was in the house. Um, how were the kids disciplined? Scolding, withholding privilege, spanking, verbal abuse, hitting, hitting with objects. How did your parents solve their disagreements? How did your parents solve their disagreements? My parents never had disagreements. That means that they were very imperfect parents because they took their disagreements out on their kids. That happened to be my family. How did they do it in your family? Very interesting questions to ask yourself. If we had a small workshop, we might even talk about it. Um, and by the time that people talk about, about all this stuff, the stuff starts spilling out. Uh, but you first need to treat people not as a diagnosis, but as a person with a real life. And then we have a way of rating that. And what we also do, we look at what's above the line. How safe have you felt in your life? And how good are you at something? Uh, competence is the best protector against getting traumatized. If you're a very good basketball player or baseball player, and you have a terrible trauma history, you'll still behave like a traumatized person, but you will really feel great playing basketball, and you'll earn a lot of money that will help you to have a better life. If you don't have any of them, your chances are bad. And then we look at neglect, and separations, emotional abuse, physical abuse, at different stages of development. Because you know, we did, made it quite a long time ago. But today, we know that the stage at which this stuff occurs has a major effect on mental and brain functioning. And so what we found is that, when we put all the data together, that 87% of the patients who were called borderline had histories of severe trauma and or neglect 
starting before age seven. And the important thing is starting before age seven because the brain matures in the context of the environment. But what is more interesting to me is something that's always fascinated me, and that is self-destructive behaviors. Uh, why do some people come home after a rough day of work, take a razor blade and cut their arms open, or take out a cigarette and stub it out? And it's very, I learned very early on that these are not what I learned in school, suicidal behaviors. These are clearly behaviors that people use in order to calm themselves down. These are behaviors to help people to change their own internal biological systems. And so I hear that in some clinics, people are told to make suicide contract with their self-mutilating systems. And I go like, that is goddamn crazy, man. Like, like, you would give up your favorite way of calming yourself down in order to please somebody you've never met before, who's probably in it for the money anyway. Um, and so the issue is, do you have something to offer people who burn themselves and cut themselves that can take the place of doing that? It can help them make more calm. That's really the challenge. And unless you have that, don't tell your patients not to try to kill themselves. And try, don't tell your patients not to cut themselves. That's their business. Your business is not to run other people's lives. So we looked at what preceded self-destructive behaviors. And it turns out that sexual abuse was a major predictor of repeated suicide attempts. Physical abuse was not a major predictor. So suicidality in kids, and in kids, and I'm really sad not to see uh, Vince Valletti, because, not only because he's not here, but also because I love the guy. Um, what he also shows in the ACE study is that suicidality is highly correlated to early childhood trauma. Why is that? If you are... 60 years old or older in this room, and you have never thought about suicide, in my opinion, there's something wrong with you. <laughs> you know, we all need to pay some attention to how we are going to exit from this life. Are you going to leave it up to strangers? Are you going to do it yourself? And you know, people can whatever decide about it, but if you've never thought about it, there's something wrong with your consciousness. Um, if you're eight years old, and you start thinking about how can I get out of this life? There's something terribly wrong. That means that your life is so miserable and you're so scared and so unhappy that death becomes better than what you're dealing with. And so this is almost always related to unbearable situations. So rather focusing on the escape route, you should focus on what they try to escape from. How can I help you to make your life safer so death is always an option. It's up to you to kill yourself. But there might be some other things I can help you with that may make life interesting and worthwhile. Okay? That's our job. Cutting. We have a new disorder in the DSM-5. Self-cutting behavior. Our and other people's research show is that you don't cut yourself for the hell of it. Everybody in our study had histories of sexual abuse, and or neglect, and or physical abuse. It's because your body becomes so upset. And because the time is short, even though I've got an extra uh, half hour or so, the core issue that I hope to come back for this afternoon is that we are supposed to comfort each other. Uh, we all get upset. And if you have somebody to whom you can blow off steam, and somebody says, that bastard, look what they did to you. And you can really join with other people who see your pain and you're hurt. You're going to be OK. But if the source of your pain is the person you're supposed to go to to comfort you, which is the only thing that kids have, your body continues to be in a state of hyperarousal. Now, as an adult, you're in a situation like this, and I'm sure many people in this room have had been in a terrible relationship where you turn to somebody and that person turned on you, then your natural solution is to either pop some Prozac or pop some Valium, or go to a neighborhood bar or start, start a wild affair, wild affair with somebody because as an adult you have options. As a child you have no options. 
I said, child, all you have is your parents. You can't go to the police. You can't tell your aunt about it. You can't tell your neighbors about it because you're wired to be loyal to your caregivers. And so what happens if, if your body is a state of agitation, fear, terror, and all these hormones are pumping, it makes you say, I'm, I'm dying, this is terrible. Then you find a way of calming yourself down. You start bumping your head against the wall. You start masturbating all the time. You start shutting yourself down so you no longer feel anything. So all of these behaviors, and I'm really, again, sorry that Vince isn't here because Vince Valeri really put it beautifully. He said, when the problems are actually the solutions, and I know that a lot of people are into the A study and seeing how bad trauma is. That's sort of interesting, but we, in some ways we knew that already. But what's interesting is the way in which the A study highlights that most problems that people have, like anorexia, drug addiction, all this stuff, in fact started off as solutions for unbearable problems. And so our job is not only to identify the trauma, for that the ACE is not the best instrument, it's fairly superficial. But the issue is to how do we help people to feel safe in their bodies? Okay? And we'll go into it further. And binging was not correlated to that, interestingly enough. Anorexia, again, was related to sexual abuse. And now came, for me, the interesting part of the study. These people were in a very nice Harvard teaching hospital, my favorite Harvard teaching hospital, actually. Cambridge Hospital, and then they had three years of therapy with very smart and thoughtful people. And um, many of them got better, and some of them didn't get better. And so I became interested in who were the people who did not get better after three years of very thoughtful therapy. And what predicted that people did not get better was neglect, and early separations. That's a very important issue, and it's a very important issue for if you are into using relationships as the way out of mental misery. Namely, there's a, not only this study, but a number of other studies would support this, is that if you have no imprint in your mind of what the milk of human kindness tastes like, your brain has a hard time responding to the milk of your kindness. It's a very big deal. You can ignore it for the sake of that you want to be cheerful, but your patients won't really get better. And so if relationships are not of comfort to you, you need to find another way of helping people to calm themselves down. And I'll talk more about it this afternoon. Uh, so, um, and, uh, at the same time that we did this study, the uh, neuroscientist Jak Panksepp does a study on little rats. And human beings are a little bit like rats, a little bit not like rats. Like rats don't paint or give lectures or make music. And in some ways they're like, because like, they all also lick each other. And they have a very warm family life. That's not how most of us think about rats, but they lick each other and lie on top of each other. and are a lot of little happy rats there waiting for you to leave the kitchen or whatever you do. Um, and so what Punksep finds is that if little ratlings are not licked by their mothers week two or three of life, they do not develop opioid receptors in the anterior cingulate, third part of your brain. And those opioid receptors in the anterior cingulate are probably the receptors of kindness receptors of nurturance. So if you don't develop those receptors, your brain just can't take it in. And that is the challenge. So how do you help people to develop a capacity to take in warmth and kindness when their brains are really set to see nothing but fear and danger? And I have another study on this. Uh, so my friends and colleagues, uh, Paul Fruin and Ruth Lanius in, in London, Ontario, do a study. And they take, um, they take a very 
too much. I think he's a very handsome man. I don't know about you, but uh, very handsome, handsome guy. And people are in the scanner, and you see this handsome man coming onto the screen in various poses. And we can see that if you're not a traumatized person, what lights up is all the curious curiosity centers of your brain, like wonder what he's like. I wonder if he also likes the same music as I do. I wonder if maybe we should go on vacation together. <laughs> and there's some potential in this guy, and maybe we'll do something. And so your excitement goes up, and your pleasure center of your brain starts lighting up. And you get all a little bit excited about meeting a handsome, dark-haired stranger. Um, then they show the same pictures to a group of people with chronic childhood trauma and neglect. This lights up in their brain. This part of the brain is called the periaqueductal gray. I like to call that part of the brain the cockroach center of the brain. That's the part of your brain that registers, get the hell out of here. This is dangerous. I want you to know that, that your lovely presence may be a traumatic stimulus for your patients. So don't count on how lovely you are disarming the defense of your patients. You might. Don't give up. And so we have a part of our brain called the fusiform gyrus that tells us who is trustworthy and who isn't. You decide for yourself which one of these guys you trust. Um, <laughs> And the part of your brain, the amygdala, the insula, the superior temporal gyrus, and the fusiform gyrus all get damaged by trauma. So it becomes hard to know who you can trust and who you cannot trust. This is not simple. If kindness could do the trick, there would be no unhappy people in this room. Certainly not in Southern California, where everybody's nice all the time. Okay? Uh, but these things get damaged. How much time do you have? I have no time. <laughs> we'll get to this this afternoon. <laughs>